on introduction, I invite Carlos Pedia to the stage. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. How's everybody doing this beautiful afternoon, morning? Good. Awesome. Well, welcome to the kingdom. If you haven't figured it out by now, we don't have any idea what we're doing, which is a good thing because, I mean, by church, systematic, structure, policy, we have failed big time already. And we're just here to continue to make history. So um, it's good that you guys are with us. Welcome to the kingdom. Again, my name is Carlos Padilla. I am the senior leader here. And um, thanks for joining on the conversation today. We're going to talk about the power of peace. Somebody say power of peace. Amen. You know, um, I, when I was putting this together and doing the design, does this sound from, look familiar to anybody? It's like the raging waters and you're that little boat out there and you're sending out an SOS and there's no... No correspondence, you know? Have you ever been there in your life? Like, have you ever been in a good season of your life and then all of a sudden it's full of fear? And the peace that you once had, it just kind of is pulled right out of you? You know, um, about a year and a half, or about two years ago, when we decided to plant roots here in Omaha, we were living with my mother-in-law. Yeah, that's cool, 39-year-old man living with his mother-in-law. Um, <laughs> but, but we were living with my mother-in-law, figuring out what we were going to do. I had been doing a lot of itinerant ministry, and we just came back from awesome, like probably one of the most amazing ministry trips I've ever been a part of in my life. I had the opportunity and pleasure of preaching in Brazil at a healing conference, and there was over 2,000 people there, and we saw over 1,900 miracles. Like, it was crazy. I'm talking about people with tumors healed out of wheelchairs. It was amazing. Praise God. Man, it was so awesome, man. I remember coming back. I had such a high of peace. You know, I was like, man, God, dude, like if this is the height of Christianity and this is what Acts looks like, man, we we're doing it. Let's go hard and let's get it when we get back to Omaha. So I remember we were um, flying on the way back. And um, by that, at that time, I was a little heavier than I was today. But man, when you're in Brazil, all you do is feed you red meat. I mean, I know you guys are from Nebraska, and I'm from Texas, but man, no, they take it to a whole nother level there, you know? I'm talking about it's red meat, red meat, red meat, and I'm coming off this, like, spiritual high and full, and my face is full, and I tell Beth, when we get home, man, I'm going to make a change. We're going to start a diet, and everything's going to be good, so what do we try to do? We did plant-based I know, yeah, I know. It's it's like it's like a sin, and it's a sin in San Antonio because I had to get this thing called soy riso instead of choy riso, you know. And I got so much hate mail on that because my all my Mexican family was like, "Man, we just own you. Man, we don't know you anymore. You went to the dark side." So we we, we made this valiant effort to to go plant based. And I remember we came off this spiritual high, and I wanted to be healthy, and we did it for like six months, no meat, just just straight plant based stuff. And then on top of that, I did something that's very foreign to me in a Texan and probably a Nebraskan too, is, is juice every day. Have you guys ever juiced every day? Like, man, like, you know, we went hard on the juicing. We didn't buy meat. We bought things. And it was like me, 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 in the blender all day. So I was taking juices and going crazy. And the moment, and the moment that I, I want to get healthy, I want to make a life change, the scariest thing happened. I went to the bathroom. And I know this is kind of a little too much, but you, you get what I'm painting down. I went to the bathroom and I looked and it was red. It scared me. You know, and I was like, oh my God, what just happened? I mean, I went to the bathroom and it's, it's the, the mess and red. What's going on? And I lost my peace. Coming from a spiritual high, coming back from Brazil, ready to conquer the world. I start a new diet. I go to the bathroom and it's red. I freaked out. I freaked out. So what did I do? I called my uncle, who's a doctor. I'm like, hey, Uncle Joe, man. Dude, I don't tell my mom, man, because she doesn't get freaked out, too. But look, I went. Through, I, I started a new diet, man. I'm on this thing. And I went to the bathroom, and I saw red there, and he stayed quiet. And my mind's going like a million miles an hour. What is it? What is it? And he goes, well, I don't know what to tell you. I mean, I'm not there. But I'll tell you one thing. Monitor it for another week. And if it's still there, let's have a, a discussion. This could be serious. That's what he sent me. That's what he told me. So I'm there in the middle of this discussion. The man of glory serving God coming and just afraid. So what do I do? I go to like to Web, WebMD. You ever done that? You know, I went to WebMD. And it's like, well, what does it mean if I have red in my stool? And it's like, cancer, all these different things. And all of a sudden, a healing minister who's having a book come out like in a couple of months about divine healing, I'm that guy. And I'm like, oh my God. And what, what looked like such a peaceful situation in Brazil I came home to was a storm. And I remember, man, I was scared. I didn't tell a lot to my wife, but I remember she'd be there at night sleeping. And I'd be so scared. I'd lay awake and stare at her saying, 
well, if I only have six months more to live, I might as well just look at her because, I mean, this could be the beginning of an end. Dude, and it stole my peace, and it was a real thing, you know? And and the, the, the week happened, and it was still the same thing. I was getting more scared, didn't sleep, man, didn't even read scripture. Like, I had totally sold out, sold cheap, man. And it was a very scary, but a very, very, very real thing. Like a very real thing. So a week goes by, and actually I meet with one of my friends in the room here, and I just break down at the table. I'm like, hey, you know what, man? Like, I just want to tell you, dude, like, I need prayer because I went to the bathroom and it, there's, like, all this red stuff, and I don't know what to do. And I looked at it, and it says colon cancer or this or this or this or this, you know? And, and I was freaking out. My friend goes, well, well, tell me about this new diet you've been doing. I was like, well, we're juicing like crazy, man, and we're just not eating meat anymore. And he goes, well, what do you put in the juice? And I was like, I don't know, man. We put, like, like celery and carrots and beets. And he goes, wait, 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 wait. You put beets in there? And I was like, yeah. He's like, that's probably why when you go to the bathroom, it's red. You know? And I was like, oh, my God. And the biggest wave of just like, oh, man, thank God. Like, oh, you know, like just in that middle of that conversation really kind of woke me up, right? But for a week and a half, I didn't sleep. I didn't read scripture. I was stressed out. And coming from a situation where we saw 1,900 people healed, I had forsaken the ship, jumped in the water, and just choosing to drown. You ever been there? Oh, cool. So we're going to talk about peace today. And, and if you haven't been there, I want to tell you about a story about a couple of people who did in the Bible, in the Gospels, and it's the disciples of Jesus. So we're going to start in Mark chapter four, and we're going to be talking about the power of peace. And we all know the story. We've heard it, you know, Jesus by this time is going throughout Judea and he's healing everybody, man, like lepers, everybody. And he's talking to Pharisees and trying to get their mindset straight, but he's doing these incredible miracles and then it gets to a point where he gets in the boat in the water because they're all coming at him for healing and he starts preaching from the boat right so he does this and these people are just kind of coming at him like a rock concert like he's the rock star and he's actually tired and he's like he goes to the boat and he stands in the boat and he starts preaching and after that the the crowd's so big he tells the disciples he tells them this this is mark chapter 4 uh verse 35 it says this, and on the same day when evening had come, he said to them, let us cross over to the other side. Somebody say, let us cross over to the other side. Okay, put that in your memory bank. Verse 36, now when they had left the multitude, they took him along in a boat as he was. Like, what does that mean? They took Jesus as he wasn't, as he was. Jesus was tired, man. He'd been doing so much ministry that everybody was pressing in and he was healing people, doing the goodness of God, showing the authentic nature of God. And he said, hey, man, we need to take a break. Let's get in the boat. Let's go across, right? So it says this, um, and, and other little boats were also with him. And a great windstorm arose. Somebody say a great windstorm arose. Okay, so Jesus with his guys just healing everybody. Jesus said, let's get in the boat. We got to go to the other side. And then these guys are fishermen. So half the people in the boat are familiar with this with the sea. They know what it's like to be in the middle, and they know how terrible it could be when certain winds pick up and stuff like that. So he's not taking strangers. He's taking people who are actually fishermen in the middle of the sea, and we'll see what happens right here. It says, a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling. Next screen. But he was in the stern, Jesus, asleep on a pillow. Somebody say, Jesus was asleep on a pillow? <laughs> Isn't it funny because Psalm says that God never slumbers and Jesus is asleep? <laughs> I'm not trying to question theology. I'm just saying it's a metaphor, right? He, he's always like looking after us, right? So he says, but he was in the storm asleep on a pillow and they awoke him and said to him, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And then Jesus woke up and said, OMG. I mean, OME. No, no, you won't find that in the Bible, right? But the, he's in a boat. He's asleep on a boat. Wind picks up, storm happens, and the guys freak out, the disciples. They wake Jesus up and say, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Then Jesus arose, rebuked the wind, and said to the sea, peace be still, and the wind ceased. And there was a great calm. We've all heard that story, right? They're in a boat, familiar territory. Gets a little rocky, wind, waves, crashing, storm. Jesus is asleep on the boat. Guys, if Jesus is asleep on a boat at rest in the Sabbath, you should be too. You should be too. If Jesus starts his declaration saying, let's go to the other side, that's a promise. We're going to get there. Right? So, okay, next week. Oh, and then he says, yeah. And he said to him, 
Uh, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? You know, how many know that Jesus was there at the creation, right? How many know that Romans 8.19 says that creation is groaning in heavy expectation for sons and daughters to be revealed, right? So Jesus, the creator, the model of sonship himself, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, who comes to introduce humanity back to God, but also introduce to humanity back to true humanity, stands there and commands things to happen, and it happens. How many know Jesus came as our substitute sometimes, but he came as our example? Amen. And if everybody, every, everything's going crazy, who's in your boat? You see, in a couple of chapters later, there's a similar story where they're in a boat. And this time, Jesus just feeds like 4,000 people, and they have leftovers, and they get in the boat to go to the other side. And what do the disciples complain about? There's not enough bread. And he had just fed 4,000 other people. See, it's not about what's in your boat. It's about who's in your boat in the middle of the storm. And if he's asleep in Sabbath, believe him and take a rest. Because if not anything you do outside the will of God to fight the devil, you're going to have to stay there in order to maintain it and do it yourself. And how many know the devil plays off exhaustion, off ignorance? You know, it brings me back to the garden too, though. You know, and I love shaping it back to the garden because how many know that, that even the things in the Old Testament served as a shadow, but there's a substance, right? And the substance is Christ, and we can find him in the Gospels. So you see in the Garden of Eden, God says it's good, right? And then he creates, he created everything and said it was good. And then he puts them in a garden. And the devil said, no, it's not really that good unless you eat from the tree. Just like these people in the storm, Jesus said you can rest. And they got fearful and ate from a different tree by obeying the wind and letting that be their, their vision instead of the promise to get to the other side. Next read. You don't have authority in the storm you can't sleep in. If you're not rooted and grounded in him, everything else is going to determine your time and temperature in life. And Jesus promised that there's trial and tribulation coming. There's going to be sorrow. There's going to be grief. There's going to be temptation. There's going to be persecution. But how many know Christianity is not about all those things? It's about finding peace in the middle of those things. See, Christianity is not about the storm. It's not about the, the, the chaos and all that stuff. That's coming. We live in a fallen world. But can you find peace in the middle of that? And I'm here to tell you today that peace isn't the absence of chaos. It's the presence of someone in your boat. Peace isn't the absence of something. God, take away this and take away that. And he wants to, but he wants to give you a revelation of what's inside of you. How many, of you, how many of you know you are prime real estate for the spirit of God to be enveloped in you? He's calling you the tabernacle now. That's why they haven't rebuilt the temple in Jerusalem, because you're now the tabernacle. And the fullness of Holy Spirit lives inside of you, crashing from side to side, giving you comfort in the middle of your storm. So if it's sickness, if it's disease, if it's financial things, don't worry. Know who's in your boat. Know who is in your boat today, guys. But you can't have authority in a storm that you cannot sleep in. Jesus goes to the cross, right? And it reminds me of the garden too. He says, it's finished. It's finished. I'm back at rest. And I'm here to present it to you so you have no other depiction of works outside of my grace to accomplish what you need in life. In the garden, God said it was good. They didn't believe him. And they went and ate from another tree. Jesus tells us today, the disciples, the world, that, hey, it's finished. And we choose not to believe him too and try to unfinish what he's already completed. And then religion makes a lot of money off of bridging the gap that's not there when the message is union. So it's not about what's in your boat, it's about who's in your boat. If you can't have, a, you can't have authority in a storm that you cannot sleep in, the default of Christianity is Sabbath rest. And guess what? It's not a day. No day is holier than the other now that Christ has come. You are the Sabbath. He lives inside of you. It's a permanent rest. It's a permanent, it's finished. It's a permanent, it's a permanent settlement that God, the Father, Holy Spirit, and Jesus had that's what they came to introduce to humanity to remind them of what they forgot about before Adam and Eve sinned in the garden. He's come to restore, he's come to redeem, not just health, not just not just a restorative justice, not just like financial blessing, but the peace. Next screen. I don't know where I am. 
This is one of my favorite scriptures because this is found in John chapter 14. And this is when Jesus, probably at one of his most vulnerable moments in life, he's talking about the Holy Spirit. He's saying, he's telling these guys that he's been telling for the last couple of months, hey, I'm going to die. I'm going to leave. But don't worry, I'm going to send you a comforter. And he says this, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives it to you. Let your heart not be troubled, neither let it be afraid. You see, this is the thing in life. Without Jesus, you have a phony peace. It's going to be temporary to temporary to temporary to temporary. It's like the dog chasing his own tail for peace and peace. And you might throw another prayer and you might throw another fast. And you're always chasing something. And there's no rest in there, even if you get it temporarily. Do you see what I'm saying? And Jesus announces before he leaves, man, he's not going to be there anymore. They depended on him, even to be a God in their image and not the God in Jesus' mind. Remember, the disciples want, they want someone like David. They want someone to come and just like put the Romans to sleep and build the the, the temple again and give them back the land of Israel. But Jesus goes, no, I'm going to be a loser. I'm going to be hanging on a tree I created because of this mindset. But he says, this peace I give to you, not as the world gives it. You see, the default pseudo peace that you get is from the fall of man. And it looks good and it feels good at some times, but it's not the peace of Christ. I give you peace, not as the world gives it. You see, the problem is, I'm going to tell you right now. I see a lot of Christians' lives in, in debate in contention with something when they're not at rest. See, don't let the world steal your peace, but more so don't let them give you their counterfeit either. You're here to announce the peace of Christ. Romans 5.1, and this is what it's about. We'll talk about it more next week, but it says that you've been justified by grace and have peace with God. See, God doesn't have beef with, beef with humanity anymore. He, they've actually settled at the cross and they plainly publish in the sight of humanity that there's no beef, that God's never seen different. It's our mindset, the division, the blindness that we've gotten from Adam that's blinded us from that intimacy. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives it, my peace. Don't let the world steal your peace, but don't accept the counterfeit either. Peace comes from one person, it's a person. His name is Jesus. It doesn't come from a situation, it comes from him himself. And believing like him puts that peace in your heart, you know? Three years ago, I was in South Africa, or no, four years ago, I was in South Africa. And um, I was on a mission trip, and I got run over by a car coming 40 miles an hour, a real story. In the middle of the street, I was there, preaching the gospel, cross over, and they drive on the wrong sides of the street there. And as I stepped, I got run over by a car. You see, but up until that point, I had been learning about the gospel of righteousness and that I am really holy, blameless, and above reproach, not based on my merit, but because of what Christ accomplished on me, in me, and through me, right, 2,000 years ago. So I started accepting that, and I started having fun with God, and when I got hit by the car, dude, I was at so much peace, that's the only thing I could feel. My legs were broken, compound fractures, people going crazy around me, I mean, the, the sirens, the awe, the fear, I could feel it all, man, but my position was in peace. I was on the floor smiling. See, because the car is coming, whether it's financially, relationally, people aren't the best representations of what they preach. But are you filled with his peace before the storm comes? Is your default to the world that, hey, it doesn't matter what comes to me, it's not going to happen through me. Are you rested? Are you settled? Are you just as much, um, as much Sabbath as Jesus is? Do you have the same belief system that Jesus has today? Because if it's not, you're going to make a lot about your storm. And it, it makes a great testimony. But my life is not about the hell and back I've been through. It's about what my Savior did for me 2,000 years ago that awakens me to be victorious in the middle of that storm. I'm all, I'm all good for your testimony. I want to hear about it. But if it's just about you and how you recovered from this and this and this, that's awesome. But let's glorify God in this and not your process. He pulls you through that and he gives you a new name, a new... A new thing, redeemed, valued, not addicted. If you are addicted, you're addicted to a new punch, a new wine that he's serving up. It's not that hard, but if you calibrate your life based on what the world gives you, dude, you're going to have to live under the mercy of that. And there's even people and great believers that will help you accommodate that. When Jesus has a bigger profession about you in the middle of that storm. So are we adopting the spirit of peace today? Because peace is a person and he don't leave. 
You could choose not to, you could choose to ignore it. You can choose not to be aware of it. We can be unmindful of it sometimes, but he's there. You know, in 2 Corinthians, it talks about a treasure. How many know that treasure doesn't become real when you find it? It's always been there waiting to be unveiled, waiting to be revealed. Revelation, something's already there. It's the veil's lifted. And Christ has done so much at the cross to make us sure in our storm that a storm is not our story. You know, when he says, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives it. When he rebukes the winds and the waves and says, peace, be still. Jesus would have used this word called shalom. Say shalom. And, and I know we read about that. And, you know, you see in the Jewish context, people, they, they offer shalom, you know, good night, how you doing, you know, uh, that kind of thing. And what it means is peace. It means harmony. It means wholeness. It means completeness, prosperity, welfare, and tranquility. But it also means something else. And it's funny, when you go to shalom in the, in the pictology, I did some research for you. So shalom, this is a, how you say it in Hebrew? And in the pictology, this is what it means. The first uh, character is shin. It means it represents two front teeth and, and can mean sharp, eat, consume, separate, or destroy. Hamin means is a picture of a shepherd's staff. The shepherd used the staff to exercise his authority over the sheep to direct and lead them. Uh, it can mean teach, lead, yoke, move forward, or authority. So you have destroy, you have the word authority, and then mim means illustrates water and waves. Funny, right, with the storm, right? Shalom, referring to water and waves in the pictology. And it says this, as nomadic people, the Hebrews did not understand the waves or waters of the ocean. So the letter came to mean chaos, mighty, or blood, right? And then the last one is vav, and it means to represent a tent peg or nail, and means to secure or hook, but it can also simply mean to peg or nail. So when you look at the pictology of the word shalom, you're not just saying peace, completion, all those things are yes, but what it means is it's the spirit that destroys chaos. They were in chaos, and Jesus, the spirit of peace himself, spoke to it to destroy the chaos. You know, shalom is probably one of the best healing prayers you can do, guys. You know, um, for, for two and a half years, I sat under uh, Chris Gore, the director of all of healing ministries at Bethel Church, and I had the pleasure and the honor of traveling with this guy around the world multiple times. And we were in Australia, and uh, Chris's team, including myself, we saw probably Today, about 80 kids healed of autism from every spectrum, from the worst spectrum to the small spectrum, like overnight, laying hands on them, right? And when Chris Gore told me, you know that when you pray shalom, you're just not imparting peace. That's a big thing. You, what you're saying is destroy chaos. So we're there in, in Australia, and we're seeing kids healed of autism, in the, and the, the testimonies are rolling in. And I remember we were in Australia at a healing conference, and there was probably about about 500 people there. So we're up all night praying for people, laying hands, and just real quick because of the volume. And I don't remember praying for this little girl in particular at night, but the next morning we show up and a family walks towards me and says, hey, we have a testimony for you. And I'm like, okay, like, who are you? What happened? And you're like, oh, you prayed for our little girl who's five years old. And I was like, well, what happened? She's like, well, we'll get her and she'll tell you. And I'm like, okay. So I'm just thinking like maybe she had like a headache or something or a back pain. I don't know, right? So I'm there and I don't remember them. And uh, I was like, so what is it? I asked the parents and the parents says, well, she's diagnosed with autism high on the spectrum. And she wakes up every morning. We have to get her dressed. We have to put her shoes on. We have to walk her to the kitchen. We got to sit her down in the seat and all these different things, you know, to kind of help her out. And I'm like, okay. So the little girl comes running towards me and she's like, hi. And she's kind of shy. And the parents are like, well, tell us tell Carlos what happened. And, uh, and she's kind of quiet. And the parents like, it was unreal. We woke up this morning and she was at the table by herself having breakfast. And I'm just like, whoa, praise God. And I was, I was like, so what happened? And I'm like, wow, this is amazing. Like this little girl who wasn't able to walk herself to the table, serve herself, was there a week before anybody else eating her cereal. So I'm like, awesome. Whoa, this is crazy. And they're like, that's not the best part. And I'm like, well, what's the best part? And the Lord goes, oh, yeah, last night when I was asleep, Jesus came to me, and he gave me a golden brain. How many know that autism is the chaos in the brain? So when you lay your hands on someone and you say shalom, it's not just a greeting. What you're saying is, I give you the spirit that destroys chaos. So you're in a position, because of who's inside you, who's in your boat, to speak. Because how many know the kingdom is voice activated? 
to speak to the storm. Shalom, my peace I leave with you. It's an unfamiliar peace that you might get from the world. And maybe it looks like it a couple of times, but man, I want you to be so rooted, grounded, and convinced that I am who I say I am, that when the storm comes, you look like me anyway. You know, um, I traveled with this guy named Todd White one time, and he told this story. He's like, you know, it's funny. When you, when you uh, get an orange and you crush it and you squeeze it, what do you get? Orange juice, right? He's like, when you get a, a lemon and you squeeze it, what do you get? Lemonade. He's like, why when you have a Christian and they're crushed by the weight of the world, you get everything but Christ? And it's simply because we're not convinced, we're not consumed, we're not enamored with his peace that takes residence inside of you. You see, Romans 5.1 says it's a peace in which you stand. Like you're in it. It's actually what it means in the Greek is that you're standing on top of it. It's your lifting platform. So you're not looking for peace in the middle of the storm. You're standing on it and it's supporting you. And it's supporting you because it's God's good pleasure to give his kids the kingdom. See, guys, we don't fight for victory here. We fight from it. We don't fight for victory. We fight from it. So what's still in your peace today? Next one. I said it earlier, but peace isn't the absence of something. It's the presence of the king himself. Peace isn't the absence of chaos. You can pray that away. That's fine. But if you don't replace it with the, with the man of peace, it's just going to be a recurring cycle. And it's going to dictate how you live. Look, I know we're in different storms in our life right now. We're at different stages. And, it, and it's good. We want to walk you through that. This is more of an invitation, but it's also meant to show you that where do you find peace in today? Are you finding it in circumstances, how people do you, or by he who's crucified for you? You see, guys, what happens to me in life isn't the greatest indication of what's true. What Jesus did for me is the greatest indication of who I am. But I'm telling you, if you adopt another meaning, another foundation, if you build on sand with another meaning that's not his shalom peace, man, you're going to be drowning. And we all know that. Cool. You know, and I'm just going to wrap it up like this, but this is a funny thing too, because remember at the beginning I had you say, and he said, let us go to the other side, right? So there's a bigger picture for Jesus. They're not just in the storm and he's asleep in there, but Jesus is not. Did he know the storm was coming? Yeah. Was he asleep in it? Yeah. Did he expect everybody else to sleep in it? Pretty much, yeah, right? But but how many know that there was a bigger picture? It wasn't about the storm. It's not about your storm. I'm not, I'm not devaluing the fact that you're going through stuff, but I'm saying, dude, there's a bigger picture in all of this. See, if you go right here on verse 35, this is the first uh, verse we read of Mark chapter 4 when they go at sea. And it says, on the same day when evening had come, he said to them, let us cross over to the other side. He's like, I promise you we're going to get there, so you should be able to rest, right? Next screen. Why do you have to go to the other side, right? Why would Jesus have to go to the other side? And then you look in uh, chapter 5, and how many know, very important, that there's no chapter breaks when Scripture was written, right? We read chapter 4, we close it, and read chapter 5 a week later, and it doesn't connect. But Jesus does his ministry, is tired, gets in a boat, let's go to the other side, for what reason? And in, in chapter 5 says this, Then he came to the other side of the sea, to, to the country of the Gard Gadarenes. And when he had come out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs and no one could bind him, not even with chains because he had often been bound with shackles and chains. You see guys, Yes, you may be in a storm by yourself, but just know that if Jesus is resting, you can rest in it too. And here's the bigger picture. He's trying to reach them. Let's go to the other side. I got business to take care of, but it's always about our battle and our interior struggle and what we got to get through and how everybody's doing us wrong. We never manifest the kingdom to anybody else. You know, it's a wake-up call, you know, because I love the church, man. I'm a champion of the church. But, you know, we see people in church just as depressed, anxious, fearful, depleted as people who don't go to church. And then when you invite them into your church, like, I look just like you without the commitment of giving. So you're called to give the ministry of reconciliation. You're here to reconcile people by your life. It doesn't matter about the storm. It matters about who's in the boat. And when they say, who's in the boat with you, they want to jump in. Fishers of men. Fishers of men. So there's always a bigger picture, man. 
Let's not make the priority about what we're going through. Let's make the priority, the priority about what he went through. Did he promise us trial and tribulation, but can we just show up and tribulate and manifest it? I promise you there's going to be trial and tribulation, but can you look like Jesus in the middle of it? Or do we have just as many excuses for those who don't know him? There's a bigger picture. I got to get to that guy. I got to get to the guy who's bound by religion, bound by frustration, by, bound by homosexuality, bound by whatever it is that doesn't endorse the true identity we know about them. I got to get there. You know, the fast track to peace right now, not a temporary one, a living one, is not forgetting what has already happened. I'll say it like this. The fast track to peace is remembering what he's already done. Remember, prior to these things, he'd done so many miracles. He had fed 5,000, 4,000, healed the sick, saw crazy miracles, and these guys are in the boat still thinking they lack. See, the fast track to peace right now is remembering what he's done, and we're going to do that right now. Because we're not just a church that preaches a good message. We're a practical church, and we're going to take communion. First Corinthians, they recite communion. Let's go ahead and pass them out. We're going to take communion right now. And I believe that when you take communion, you can be healed. You can be set free from addiction. You can be set free from whatever it is you're going through. Guilt, shame, condemnation. Dude, Jesus bore all that on the cross, and he's waiting to show you and introduce you to himself. guys okay whose peace do you have today guys and every time we take this sacrament we endorse the fact that what he did was enough like jesus this is enough for my family's peace jesus this is enough for my healing jesus you're enough for my for my true identity god so in corinthians it says that they um they pass around the bread and the wine in remembrance of him. But then it also says this. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me until I come back. So how many know the productivity, the promise of what Jesus paid for is for right now, right? He said, do this until I come back. You see, guys, believing in heaven will get you to Jesus, but believing like heaven brings it here. Believing like Jesus brings it here right now. You don't have to wait to have your everlasting promise in heaven. He's came, he's come to bring the kingdom now. So let's lift a, let's give a toast to God with a bread. That it was his initiative. Mankind was lost, and while we were still sinners, he said, crunch. And I can't wait till they find out what this means. So today we say, God, we thank you, Lord, for the bread. We thank you for our families, Lord. We thank you for your healing power. We thank you, Lord, for the power of restoration and redemption that's in your blood, God. Today we say we do business with you and we take your peace as our foundation, as our default, God. And I thank you, Lord, that when people encounter us this week, they encounter you. So we break their bread and we eat it. Thank you, Jesus. Whoa. <laughs> God. And then he took the cup and he passed it to his disciples and said, hey, this right here, do this in memory of your sin. No, no, no. He didn't say that. Don't. That's an un. <laughs> you know, that's not the. If you have that version, just throw it away. He said, "Do this in remembrance of me, of what I complete, of how I hit the mark." And when you focus on this, you won't take it in an unworthy manner. So we thank you, Jesus, for what you've done on the cross, for the blood that was poured out, for the forgiveness of just not my verb sins, the action, the fruit, but the sinful nature, Lord, that blinded me from who you saw me to be, God. I thank you for the reintroduction, the evidence, the conclusion, the settlement that the Trinity celebrates right now, that holy and blameless above reproach is your name. This drink. Thanks, God. Thanks, God. Mm. My shalom, I leave with you, Jesus says. The ability to destroy chaos, the ability to have peace, be content. 
because you know, guys, I'm going to talk about this next week, but I just want to brief you. It's okay to be okay. It's okay to be okay. It's okay to be okay today. We make a lot of, if you're not okay, it's okay. And I'm for that too. We want to find healing for you. But you know, it's okay and to wake up and be loved by God. That's his intention. So we'll talk about peace on a more practical level next week. But hey, we're going to have some uh, prayer team up here. If you guys want to pray for anything, you know, peace. We're going to encourage what peace looks like. Come on up. We want to bless you guys. Um, we'll see you next week. We love you guys. Thank you for coming to the kingdom. Amen. Thank you, God. Praise God.